Hey YouTube, thanks for tuning in. Today I'm going to be taking a look at the Acer Swift 3, which you can see sitting right behind me. This is the model with the 13.5 inch uh, 3x2 aspect ratio display, which I think the resolution is like 2254 by 1502 something like that. Uh, but it's a pretty unique display, and this is a mid-range laptop. Mine has the Core i5, it's the 10th gen. Uh, so that's four cores, eight threads, has eight gigs of RAM. It came with a 256 gigabyte SSD. I put in a one terabyte uh, that I had that I swapped in. And the reason I'm making a video on this, because I've only had it for about two and a half days now, and the reason I'm making a video after such a short amount of time is because this laptop is currently on sale at Walmart for $599 or 600 bucks in the United States. So that's a really attractive price for a laptop that's pretty unique in this price range. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about that. Let's get right into it and ask what makes the Acer Swift 3 different than other mid-range devices like Lenovo's 7 series or the HP Envy series. We'll start with the good, the display. The Acer Swift 3 has easily the best laptop screen I've seen on a laptop at this price point and one of the best laptop screens I've ever used, period. It gets incredibly bright, topping out at 400 nits, which is the same as the MacBook Air. The color reproduction is superb, superb, <laughs> providing rich colors without veering into oversaturation. It also handles brightness changes nicely without losing too much contrast by turning things down. This display looks very similar to the M1 MacBook Air, like I said, which is really good company to be in. And I've gotta say, I think this is the best display I've ever used on a Windows laptop. It's that good. Really the only competitor I've had is, I had a ThinkPad with an HDR display, an X1 Carbon, the seventh gen, 500 nits. Um, and I think this one actually looks better in terms of color reproduction. It seems more accurate. And also that brightness scaling is a big thing that I think a lot of displays don't do well, so really nice. Um, so on top of this being just a plain great display with that contrast in the colors, it is a three by two aspect ratio running at a really lovely resolution of 2256 by 1504. This provides really nice sharpness and the three by two aspect ratio is amazing for web browsing and writing and Excel, anything where you're reading you know, lines of text. Most video content will be letterboxed on this, but fortunately, the backlight bleed is pretty low on this screen, at least on mine. So it's not really an issue to have that letterbox. And in fact, you, you kind of barely notice it. It's, it's pretty impressive. So I really can't say enough good things about the screen. So I think that means it's probably time to move on. Another nice change up Acer delivers from most mid-range laptops is the inclusion of a really good Intel AX Wi-Fi card. Um, a cheap Wi-Fi card can actually have a surprisingly bad experience in terms of the day-to-day -day performance of a laptop. So I'm pretty appreciative anytime a manufacturer spends a couple of extra bucks to give you decent Wi-Fi. So kudos, kudos to Acer on that Intel Wi-Fi card. So those are the two things that Acer did really well on the Swift 3, but there are no free lunches in the world of commodity manufacturing. So where did Acer have to cut to invest in that display in networking? Well, in short, the overall build quality. To put it frankly, the Acer Swift 3 is easily one of the flimsiest all-metal laptops I've ever used. I think it probably is the flimsiest for an all-metal laptop. It actually kind of surprised me um, because the main shell actually kind of looks like it has, it's the unibody sort of cut out, kind of like a MacBook or a ton of laptops these days. But if that's the case, which it appears to be, this metal must be cut out to be super thin because um, you can see it flex really easily. Um, so there's quite a bit of deck flex when you put much pressure on the keyboard, like you can feel it uh, quite a bit when you're typing, especially on the keys more towards the center. Um, or in the touchpad area. It's not too bad down at the bottom where you a lot of times will rest while typing, so it could be a lot worse. The main issue I have noticed while typing is that during intense typing sessions, the whole laptop deck can get a bit of a rattle when you strike some keys, which you can hear and feel, uh, which is not that great. In fact, pretty much any time you touch the laptop or tap it in any way or sit it down on the table, it has a little bit of a rattle and it sounds hollow. Um, it just doesn't sound very good to touch. It sounds pretty cheap. 
Um, and I've used actually even some cheap plastic laptops that feel a bit sturdier and denser. Um, the HP Stream series, which they're not good laptops. I wouldn't recommend buying them for lots of reasons, but they feel pretty sturdy and those are all plastic. So this is just kind of a, like I said, it's a little bit of a flimsy feeling laptop. So I, I don't know that this is bad enough that it's gonna cause the laptop to like fail prematurely unless it's taking a lot of abuse or like writing in a backpack with textbooks. That probably might not be a good idea for this, um, but it is kind of annoying and it would be a lot more annoying if I'd paid $900 for this instead of $600. To unfortunately keep with the theme of rattling, the trackpad has a bit of a rattle when you tap on it and also sometimes a bit of a rattle when you click on it as well. So it's far from the worst that I've seen in terms of trackpads rattling, and it's not usually enough to be really disruptive, not the way that the keyboard kind of can be sometimes, but it does fall way short of the best trackpads that I've used on mid-range laptops, which are often nearly indistinguishable from good trackpads on high-end laptops. So aside from the rattling, I would say this is a pretty good trackpad. The track gain is really good. It uses the Windows Precision drivers and they work just as expected. Um, I just wish it felt a little more solid uh, in its position and its mounting. The other major, major, major shortcoming on the Swift 3 are the speakers. To put it simply, as my triple majors may have implied, they are terrible, they suck. They don't get loud at all. They have basically no bass, and everything sounds really tinny and hollow. It's been a really long time since I've bought a laptop with speakers this bad. Um, unless you're in a really quiet environment, they might not even be loud enough for you to hear everything that's going on in like a Zoom meeting. So they're, they're borderline bad enough that they might not even function for you at a basic level. Um, they're really terrible speakers, so if you're gonna be using this laptop uh, and you know, listening to things a lot of times, you probably wanna use the money that you saved on it if you got it on sale to buy some nice wireless headphones. Alright, to get back to input devices, how is the keyboard aside from that rattle that I was complaining about? Well, it's actually pretty good. The keys definitely look a bit narrow, they just look sort of a bit squeezed, like if you were adjusting the size of a picture and didn't do it proportionately. Uh, but I haven't really had any issues actually typing on it, I've been able to get up to speed pretty good. So the keys provide a pretty nice bounce, and it's a lot comfier than something like the MacBook Air keyboard, which you know you're just sort of going down to the bottom, or the Razer Blade Stealth keyboard that I've used before. The biggest problem with the keyboard is the silver on silver lettering. From a normal laptop typing angle, the glare on the keys makes it surprisingly hard to read, and the backlighting doesn't really help much at all, and sometimes it can honestly make it seem worse. So it's really time, I think, for laptop manufacturers to stop using silver keys unless you're going to go all out with a really high-end backlighting solution. Just put black keys with white lettering on this. Come on, do it. The port selection on the Swift 3 is fine, I guess. Fine, pretty good, somewhere in that neighborhood. I would have preferred a second USB-C port for charging instead of the dedicated barrel charger. But aside from that, there's not too much to complain about. The, the one USB-C port that it has is a Thunderbolt 4 port, and it does do charging and display port out. Um, so it's a fully functional USB-C port, um, but it would be nice if there was a second one. It'd also be nice if there was some sort of a card reader, even micro SD, but that's become rarer and rarer, so I don't really expect that anymore, and therefore I can't really complain about it. 
As for performance, I haven't really put it through its full paces yet, though I'm not really planning to stress this laptop a ton. That's why I was sort of okay buying a model with only eight gigabytes of RAM. So using some Affinity Photo um, or some sort of like raw photo editing is probably as hard as I'll ever really push it, maybe some light gaming. Um, as you can see, I'm including some footage. I did do a little bit of gaming on it with two games, played some Rocket League at first. You can see the settings and then also the performance. And then also a little bit of a first person shooter called Verdun. And that came out in 2015. So it's not a particularly demanding game, but it's not super old either. And, and they were both playable, so this has the Intel Iris Plus graphics. And and yeah, I guess they're better than the old HD 620, not as good as the new Iris XE. Um, so for light, older gaming, it's definitely possible. Obviously, it's not going to be a super strong gaming machine. You're not going to be playing Cyberpunk on this. Um, but then for other performance, web browsing has been perfectly fine. Uh, like I said, the Wi-Fi has performed really well for me, which is impressive and help makes it extra snappy going from page to page. Uh, and yeah, it's been as expected on an Ultrabook. I haven't done anything, like I said, though. I haven't really pounded it hard. So I don't really have any strong judgments on battery life. Like I said, it's only been two and a half days since I've had this. Uh, based on my usage thus far, and I do tend to crank the brightness brighter than I think a lot of tech reviewers when they're evaluating battery because I don't know, what's the point of using it if the screen doesn't look good? So I tend to crank the brightness a little bit and I feel like I'm getting about six to seven hours, which is kind of what I expect from, from a, an Ultrabook, an Intel Ultrabook. So some of the reviews I've read have had it getting higher battery life than that, some like 11, 13 hours. Some also have had it sort of on the lower end, so it seems that people get different experiences from it. So I may have a better judgment on that in the future, I'm sure I will. Um, but it seems to be about average for an Ultrabook in terms of battery life. As for Windows Hello login options, sadly the Swift 3 doesn't have an IR camera. That's my favorite way to use Windows Hello because it's actually it's perfect on a laptop when you just open it up and boom, it looks at you and it logs you in. It's perfect. It does come with a fingerprint reader and my experience on the fingerprint reader thus far is like many other Windows laptop fingerprint readers. It works okay, except for it tends to get smudged up really quickly. So you oftentimes will have to wipe it off to get it to read your finger, at least I do. And that's pretty annoying. So I probably will in the long term just use PIN to always log into it because having an unreliable fingerprint reader, one that you always have to wipe down before you use it, is kind of worse than not having a fingerprint reader at all. All right, so the last area that I'll comment on the Swift 3 is the appearance. So for the most part, it's a reasonably attractive, also pretty generic looking Ultrabook. It has that basic sort of wedge shape that you get from a lot of Ultrabooks, sort of the XPS 13 type of shape. Um, in terms of the finish, the specific finish on the Swift 3 is it reminds me a lot of an older MacBook Pro, so something from like the early 2010s, where it almost has, it's like a dry type of finish, and it's very silvery, and it kind of like if you are typing on it for a long time and your hands get a little sweaty, it gets like the sort of the same coloration as the old MacBook Pros. It reminds me just a lot of um, a MacBook Pro from the early 2010s in terms of the finish on the metal. Um, but like I said, a lot flimsier feeling. But the finish, very similar. So, one note about the appearance that I find a little bit odd is that when you close the lid, the top lid doesn't match exactly to the bottom lid in terms of size. I hope you can see on these the shots that I, I got because it's not the easiest to tell, but it's a little smaller. The, the lid is a little smaller than the base. Um, and it looks intentional because it's like symmetrical on both sides. Um, but it seems like a little bit of a weird design decision. I think it would look better if they matched perfectly, but hey, uh, I guess Acer is gonna do their thing. And so aside from just the general look of it, which I think, like I said, is fine, the one thing that I do think really sort of detracts from the appearance a little bit, and maybe this is just me being a hater, but I hope not, is the Acer logo on the lid. Um, two things about it, one, I, I don't, really like the Acer logo. I don't think it's a very good looking logo. It feels really dated to me. Um, just not very, it's just sort of, it's a word mark. 
it doesn't look very modern. It's not a very striking word mark. Um, so I'm just not crazy about it. I'm also not crazy about the implementation of it. It kind of, you know, it looks like... So, you know, I had the Ma MacBook Air um, a couple weeks ago, and that it's like it's the same piece of metal as the actual laptop itself. It's just a different finish on it. It just has the mirror finish. This feels like it's a piece of plastic that's sort of embedded into the lid of the laptop. And I think it's metal. It's hard to tell. I guess time will tell if it gets scratched up easier than the rest. But something about it to me just does not look particularly good. And it makes it feel kind of cheap. And the same thing, the logo underneath the screen. Um, and right there, it's almost even more noticeable. It looks kind of cheap. It feels plastic shiny rather than metal shiny. I, I don't know a better way to explain that. Um, and it's really striking there because it's right next to the Swift logo, for since this is the Acer Swift 3, uh, which looks a lot better. It has this like great spacing. It's a much more modern font. So I think this laptop would look so much better if instead of having that shiny Acer logo front and center, on the back of the lid, if they just had the Swift logo down there, like in one of the corners, a little bit smaller, I think it would look great. So come on, maybe for the 2021 model Acer, um, get rid of that big, you know, old school Acer logo and just throw a, a nice little clean Swift logo on somewhere. Okay, well, that's a lot said, but what's my final verdict on the Acer Swift 3, or at least the best final verdict that I can give after two and a half days? Uh, well, just based on the way it feels and what I talked about with the rattles and the fact that there's quite a bit of give in the chassis, I'm not sure I would recommend this for people that are going to be carrying their laptop around every day, like students that are going to be taking it from class to class, in and out of the, the backpack where you might have books in there as well. Um, I'm just not completely sure it's going to hold up for that kind of thing, or if you're a business traveler where you're going to be going on like sales presentations all the time. It just, you know, that's something where a uh, more ruggedly built laptop, something like a, a ThinkPad, uh, I hate to say it, or like an HP Pro Book, an Elite Book, one of those, um, would be a better choice probably. So this laptop I think is a really interesting choice if you're like on a budget and you want to do photo editing or graphic design. Because those are two types of things that don't require that much horsepower, uh, really, as long as you've got a decent computer. And having that, that great screen where it gets really bright, the colors are really nice, and the 3 by 2 aspect ratio is, is great for using Photoshop and doing photo editing. Because it just gives you extra space to have the user interface around your photos, a lot of which are in 3x2 anyway. Um, so they're also you know, native if you want to view them full screen. Uh, straight out of the camera without any additional crop. So it's really great for photography. It's a, it's an awesome camera, or sorry, an awesome budget laptop uh, for photo editing, especially in a thin and light class. Um, you may not want to be taking it out with you if you're a nature photographer in the field. Uh, leave it at home and edit when you get back, or at least in the car. But yeah, it's really, that, that screen is awesome for photo editing. Um, also, if you're someone who writes a lot or does a lot of Excel work, that extra vertical space um, and just having a nice, really sharp screen is extremely pleasant to use. Uh, so awesome for that as well, as well as just for general computing. Because um, like I said, even for like video playback, the screen is good enough that the letterboxing is not really a big deal. Though if you're going to be watching a lot of videos, there are probably better op options just due to how bad those speakers are. Um, and so I guess when it really comes down to it, I would say I don't know that I would recommend this laptop at full price at $900 for the 8 gig model. Um, just because of that, it doesn't to me feel like a $900 laptop in 2020 for an Ultrabook style laptop. It's just a little, you know, it is really light, but it just doesn't feel quite sturdy enough for 900 bucks. At $600, it's extremely hard to look past because of how good the screen is. Um, I can definitely put up with the, the build quality, the, the little bit of flimsiness at that price. The speakers are a little bit of, of a bigger deal. I'm not sure where I'm going to come down on that because they're, they're kind of passable if you're watching sort of like a podcast style video, but they, they're really not good if you're watching like a movie um, or a TV show, like something like The Mandalorian where you've got really good sound effects and such. So I don't know. It's a really interesting laptop. It's far from perfect. Uh, but that screen makes it really attractive, and I think at 600 bucks, it's worth it. If you need a laptop and you're in that range and you want a good screen, especially, like I said, if you're going to do photo stuff, um, 
maybe give it a shot and you know be open to returning it but it's that screen is amazing at six hundred dollars um, so anyway, I didn't have a super clear-cut conclusion, but I hope this video was helpful anyway. If you have any questions, feel free to post them, and I'll see what I can do. Thanks for watching.